right. It's a great honor to be here again tonight to be able to preach to you. I want to thank Pastor Anderson and Brother Russell and the congregation here for that opportunity. And the title of my sermon tonight is An Overview of Prayer. An Overview of Prayer. See, prayer is such a huge subject in the Bible. There's so many scriptures on it. And so we're just going to briefly cover this subject tonight. I'm going to do my best to just do a, a basic overview of this uh, subject. And hopefully we'll all learn a little bit more about the subject in the Bible. Uh, basically, I want to answer six questions tonight about prayer, and that is simply the the who, the what, the when, the where, the why, and the how we should pray. Okay, so let's uh, begin. So you're there in Isaiah chapter 7, and I want to start by talking about why. You know, why should we pray? What's the purpose behind prayer? And the first reason is because it's a commandment of God. It says right there in Isaiah chapter 7, look down if you would at verse 10. It says, Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask. Now notice, he says ask. Ask in the Bible, it also means pray. You know, pray just simply means to ask. So he says, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. So he's simply just telling him, Hey, just ask for something. That's all I want you to do. But look at what Ahaz says. It says in verse 12, But Ahaz, Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. So, Notice what Ahaz did, this stubborn, uh, wicked, rebellious person. He just said, you know what, I'm not going to ask. You know, God commanded him to ask. He said, ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But he said, no, I'm not going to ask. And, you know, that's the exact same thing that we say as well whenever we decide not to pray on any particular day. You know, because God is commanding us in his word to pray. That is his commandment. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17, it says, pray without ceasing. It also says in 1 Samuel 12, uh, it says, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. So if you cease to pray, if you do not pray, then that is a sin. And you're just like Ahaz whenever he said that he's not going to ask. You know, you're stubborn whenever you do that. And it goes on to say in verse 13, and he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is that a small thing for ye to weary men? But will ye all weary my God also? And so God is tired of Ahaz. He's tired of what he's doing. He's tired of his rebellion. And, you know, I don't want God to be tired of me, so I want to make sure that I ask for things I pray every single day. Now, another reason to pray, why we should pray, is because God hears all of our prayers. But not only does He hear all of our prayers, but He also loves our prayers as well. He loves it whenever we pray to Him. It says in 1 John chapter 5, and verse 14, you don't have to turn there, but it says in verse 14, And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. And so God hears all of our prayers, and He's going to answer them if they're according to His will. And so, see, this is a great honor and a great privilege and a great power that we have at our disposal, and that is to simply pray to the Lord. So it also says in 1 Peter chapter 3, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and His ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So God is open, His ears are open to our prayers. It also says in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 8, it says, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps, and listen to this, and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. So the, uh, these, these um, creatures, uh, the four and twenty elders, they are offering these prayers unto God as a sweet savor. It also says in Revelation 8, 3, it says, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the Lord. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. So God loves it whenever we pray to him. In fact, it is a, a sweet smell unto him. It is like incense unto him. Also in the book of Proverbs, it talks about this as well. It says in verse eight, uh, chapter 15 and verse 8, it says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. God delights in your prayer. And it also says in verse 29 of the same chapter, it says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. And so we should pray to God because he hears our prayers and he loves all of our prayers. Now turn, if you would, to 2 Kings chapter 20. 2 Kings chapter 20. I'll also give you another verse about how God hears all of our prayers and He answers our prayers if we pray according to His will. It says in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7, it says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. 
Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth, and he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? But you know what? We have to ask him, though. But he will give us good things. Now, I also want to talk about... Um, that the fact that prayer changes things. You know, a lot of people think that prayer is just an exercise or it's something that you just do every day just to make God pleased with you. But, you know, the thing is that prayer actually does change things. It actually helps your situation. And I want to show you probably my favorite example in the whole Bible of how prayer really changed a life, changed someone's life. So you're there in 2 Kings chapter 20, and I want you to look down at verse 1. Now, in those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. So Isaiah is coming to this guy, and he's just telling him, You're going to die. But not only that, he says, For thou shalt die and not live. So he's putting big emphasis on the fact that he's not going to live. He's not going to live anymore. He's about to die. You know, there's, I mean, it looks like there's no hope for Hezekiah. But look at what Hezekiah does. It says in verse 2, Then he turned his face to the wall, and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. So that's a very short prayer that he prayed there. But you know what? It worked, because let's take a look at what happens next. Turn It says in verse 4, And it came to pass, afore Isaiah was gone out into the middle court. So Isaiah hasn't even gone that far yet. You know, this, this happened all really quickly that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. So God heard his prayer, and God is going to answer Hezekiah's prayer by allowing him not to die. But not only is he not going to die, God is going to give him so much more than that as well. And it, look at verse 6. So not only is he going to die, but it says, and I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for mine own sake and for my David or servant's David's sake. And so not only did God preserve Hezekiah's life, but he also gave him so much more than that as well. See, God can do so much for us, but all we have to do is ask. We just have to ask him. So turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. This is another interesting story that I, I, was, uh, I saw whenever I was studying this out, but it says in Matthew chapter 26, you're turning to Mark chapter 1, but in Matthew 26, this is uh, Jesus, and he is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's about to be betrayed and about to be crucified, and his disciples are trying to defend him, but he says in verse 53, he says, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? And so... Uh, Christ had such confidence in his prayers that he could just pray to God and then God's going to defend him. He's going to protect him from, from all sorts of evil. You know, he's going to give him 12 legions of angels. But then he goes on to say, but how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that it, thus it, mis, um, it must be? So he didn't actually pray that prayer, but he had such confidence in prayer that he knew that he could be uh, delivered if he just prayed. Now, now I want to talk about the where and when of prayer, right? Where should we pray and when should we pray? And the first point of that is we should pray alone, right? So you're there in Mark chapter 1, and I think this is a great verse. Look down, if you would, at verse 35. It's a great verse that teaches us how to pray. This is Jesus. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary pray place and there prayed. So Jesus Christ, he woke up a great while before the day. So it's in the morning. And then he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. So he prayed early and he prayed by himself. That's a great place to. That's a great uh, place and time to pray. Is by yourself, early in the morning. Uh, turn if you would to Matthew chapter six. We'll spend a lot of time there. It also says in Mark chapter six and verse forty six. And when he, referring to Jesus, had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. So once again, he's by himself. Luke five sixteen. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. All these times he's alone. He's by himself. Luke six twelve. 
And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. So not only is he waking up a great while before day to pray, he's also continuing all night in prayer to God as well. He's praying without ceasing. And that's what we should do as well. You should pray without ceasing. Now, uh, Jesus talks a lot about prayer in the Sermon on the Mount. And look there, if you would, at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 5, where the Bible reads, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, Pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. And so we see once again that Jesus is teaching us that we should pray alone. We should pray by ourselves where nobody can see us. And that's where the majority of our prayers should be, it should be done at. You know, our long prayers, you know, uh, and everything. But there's other places that we should pray as well. You know, a great place to pray is in church as well. So Jesus Christ talked about this in Matthew 21 and verse 13. He said, And said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And so Jesus calls his house a house of prayer. And that's why we pray here at church. We pray before the service starts. We pray before going soul winning. We pray, uh, we pray many times during church. Church is a great place to pray. And uh, it says in Mark chapter 11, verse 17, he said, And he taught, saying unto them, it is, it is, is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer? But you have made it a den of thieves. And then he repeats this as well in Luke 19. And he's quoting Isaiah chapter 56 whenever he says that. <clears throat> but I also want to talk about the book of Acts. Now, the book of Acts talks about the early church right after Jesus Christ uh, uh, went up to heaven. And it talks a lot about prayer in that book. And I'll just read you just a few verses from the book of Acts. But it says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 14, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And that's at the church. You know, we're talking about all the times that the Bible talks about praying in church. It also says in Acts 2.42, it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. It says in Acts 3.1, now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. And it also and it just goes on and on and on. I could go th for many more verses in the book of Acts because praying in church is very important as well, you know. The Bible emphasizes that. In Luke 2:37 it says and she was a widow of about four score and four years which departed not from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers. Listen to this night and day. So she prayed night and day. That should be us as well. There should be an emphasis on prayer in our lives. There should be an emphasis on prayer at church as well. <clears throat> we should pray always. You know, we talked about how, you know, uh, this lady, she prayed night and day and Jesus woke up a great while before the day and he stayed up all night praying. Now, I want you to, I just want you to continue and stay in Matthew chapter 6. And I'll read to you a few other verses about praying always. It says in Romans chapter 12, in verse 12, it says, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Right? It also says in Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 18, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So that verse uses the word all quite a bit. And that's because we should be praying always. We should be praying for all things always. It also says in Colossians 4.2, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. It says in Philippians chapter 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so it's very important uh, the when and where we should pray. We should be praying constantly. You know, we should be praying throughout our day. And we should be praying every day. And we should be praying alone and at church. So there's many different uh, places and times that we can pray, right? So let's talk about how to pray, right? There, the Bible talks about this a lot as well. <clears throat> Look down, if you would, at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7. Because in this chapter, Jesus talks a lot about prayer. And he's going to show us how to pray. It says in verse 7, it says, but when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. 
Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. And so God is saying here that we should not use vain repetitions because that's what the heathen do. They repeat prayers over and over again vainly. And I'd like to give a few examples of this because about a year ago, I was spent some time in the Philippines, and they're very uh, Catholic there. And Catholics love to, to repeat uh, vain prayers, right? And so I saw these everywhere. You know, I saw, for example, I saw uh, yard signs everywhere that said, save your family, pray the rosary, right? But that's not how you save your family. You know, you save your family by uh, preaching them the gospel. You know, praying the rosary is not going to help. <clears throat> I was in a taxi cab one time, and then they had a big sign inside that said, Come, Lord Jesus, come into my uh, life. Bless me, help me, heal me. But then it says this in parentheses. It says, repeat many times daily this miracle prayer, right? Mm -hmm. So they're just telling you, just keep praying this over and over and over again. And in the Philippines, they're so Catholic that, you know, one time me and my wife went to uh, the supermarket, and every hour on the hour, what they would do is they would um, play the Hail Mary uh, uh, prayer, and they would pray it every hour on the hour, um, depending on, on what time it is. For example, if it was 8 o'clock, then they would play it eight times. If it was 3 o'clock, then they'd play it three times. And nobody in the whole store was allowed to move during that time. Everybody just had to stand still and bow their heads and everything like that. So it's crazy over there, but I mean, th that's just, that's vain repetitions. And we should avoid those things. You know, we should avoid being like the heathen, like Catholics. Now, Jesus, but here's the thing about that is that some people will take this overboard and they'll say that we should never repeat our prayers. But you know, Jesus Christ talked a lot about repeating our prayers over and over again. But I'll show you the difference in just a moment. But let's talk about what Jesus said about this. Because in Luke chapter 18, Jesus gave this parable. And he said in verse 1, he said, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? And so Jesus just uh, told us this parable about <clears throat> how this woman, she's just continually coming to him and praying and praying over and over again, and he answers her prayer. It also says in the book of Luke in, in chapter 11, you stay there in Matthew chapter 6, but it says, And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me. I cannot arise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. So, you know, this guy just keeps knocking on the door, knocking on the door, knocking on the door, and finally he gives him what he needs. And so God speaks highly of repeating our prayers, but here's the difference. We should not use vain repetitions, right? And Jesus Christ, he repeated his prayers over and over again, and it talks about this in the book, of, not in the book, but whenever he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, he repeats his prayers. It says in Mark 14, 39, this is whenever he's in the uh, Garden of Gethsemane, it says, and again, he went away and prayed and spake the same words. So, you know, he goes back and forth from the disciples and he prays the exact same prayer that he prayed just a minute ago. It also says in Matthew 26, 44, the same instance, he said, and he left them and went away again and prayed the third time saying the same words. So see, Jesus prayed the same prayers over and over again, but the difference is that he didn't pray vainly. He didn't pray in vain repetitions. Whenever he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, his sweat was as great drops of blood. That's definitely not a vain prayer, you know? So we should pray not vainly, but we should pray fervently, right? And that leads me to my next point, that we should pray fervently in the Spirit. So keep a bookmark there in Matthew chapter 6, and I want you to go to uh, 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17.
While you're turning there, I'm going to read to you a couple other verses. So Colossians 4 and verse 12, it says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in, in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So not only was he uh, fervently praying, but it says that he was always laboring fervently for you in prayers because prayer, praying can be difficult, you know. And it says that he was laboring, he was always laboring fervently for you in prayers. It also says in James chapter 5, it says in verse 13, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So it talks about the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And then it gives us an example. It says in verse 17, it says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. And so... God gives us this example of a great prayer, a, a, a great man of faith, that, and that is Elijah. So let's take a look at one of Elijah's prayers. All right, so you're there in 1 Kings chapter 17. I meant to tell you 1 Kings chapter 18, my mistake. So just turn over the page and look at 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 36. We're going to take a look at one of Elijah's prayers and how he prayed fervently in the Spirit. Now, this is whenever Elijah is do, basically having a... Uh, a showdown, I guess you could say, a duel with the prophets of Baal, you know, and it says in verse chapter 36, and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. And so that's that's his prayer. That's his fervent prayer. He prays it to God, and God immediately answers him in the next verse. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, and let none of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon, and slew them there. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So notice, this prayer was very fervent of, of Elijah. You know, there was a lot on the line here. You know, if he, if he messed up, then he could have uh, been killed, or, you know, all the Baal worshippers would have uh, remained alive. There was a lot at stake here, but he prayed fervently in the Spirit, but not only that, his prayer was very bold as well. And that leads me to my next point, the fact that we should pray boldly. You know, think about Daniel. Whenever the king said, you, you're not allowed to pray to anybody except for me, what did Daniel do? He opened up all the windows and he continued to pray just like he always did. Turn to, if you would, to Genesis chapter 18. And we'll take a look at an example of a very bold prayer in Genesis chapter 18. In Ephesians 3.12, it says, "...in whom we have boldness and access with confidence..." by the faith of him. And Hebrews 4.16, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Okay, so the Bible talks very highly of, of praying boldly unto God. And this story that we're going to look at in Genesis chapter 18, this is whenever Abraham is praying unto God. And Abraham is basically uh, making intercession for uh, the, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he starts off, we're not going to read all the verses, but he starts off by saying, God, you know, if you could find 50 righteous people in the city, will you spare it? And he says, yes. And then he goes down to 45, goes down to 40, 30, 20. And then look, if you would, at, at verse 32. And he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure, 10 shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for 10's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. And so this was a very bold thing to ask of God. You know, God, you know, he just kept lowering it and lowering it and lowering it. And, you know, God wants us to have bold prayers unto him. And not only that, he wants us to have uh, our prayers to have 
faith behind it. You know, we should pray in faith, believing that God is going to give us what we're, we ask of him. It says in Matthew 21, in verse 21, it says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith, and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say, say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. So once again, all things that you ask in prayer, but listen to this, it says believing, ye shall receive. So you have to believe it whenever you pray it. It also says in Mark chapter 11, verse 22, it says, And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye uh, receive them, and ye shall have them. And so you have to pray with faith. You have to have faith behind it. It says also in 1 John 5, 15, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. And so once again, the prayer of faith. Hebrews eleven six. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. <clears throat> now turn back, if you would, to Matthew chapter 6. So we talked about the why we should pray, and we also talked about the when and where, and we talked about the how we should pray, pray but let's talk about the who and the what should we pray for. You know, who should we pray for, and what should we pray for, right? And the first thing, uh, we're going to go through Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus tells us how to pray, and we're going to talk about this. So the first thing, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9, After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. So this is the Lord's prayer. And the first thing that he prays for is he's just praising the Lord. You know, he's saying, hallowed be thy name. You know, he's praising the Lord. And that should be a big part of our prayer life as well. Just praising the Lord, blessing the Lord. It all, uh, you know, and it talks about this a lot in the book of Psalms. I'll just read you a couple of examples. Psalm 103 in verse 1 and 2, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And we should be doing this every day. We should be praising the Lord. We should be blessing the Lord. And let's take a look at verse 11 in Matthew chapter 6. Let's continue on things that we should pray for. It says in verse 11, Give us this day our daily bread. And so another thing that we should pray for is for our carnal needs. You know, we need things in this life. And for uh, an example that's given here is for our food, our daily bread. And so it's totally fine to pray for those things. It also says in James chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not. And this is the reason, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask and miss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. So we shouldn't ask for things to consume it upon our lust. We shouldn't ask for things like a fancy car or a fancy house, but we should ask for the things that we actually need, you know, our daily bread, you know, things like that. Another thing that we should do in our prayer life is we should confess our sins to God. It, look at verse 12, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12. It says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And so we should confess our sins unto God, and God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. That's what it says in 1 John chapter 1. It also says in Proverbs 28 and verse 13, it says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. So we should be continually confessing our sins unto God, and He will forgive us for our sins. That's what David did in Psalm chapter 51, and he, and he obtained favor from the Lord after he did that. Another thing that we should do is we should constantly be thanking God for all the wonderful things that, that he's given him. And I know that I'm being you know, repetitive, I'm just going on and on and on, but there's just so many things to pray for. You know, There's just so many reasons to pray, there's so many things to pray for. And this is just a very brief overview. Every single one of these points could have its own sermon, but I just want you to have a, a, a good a view of prayer. And so we should be uh, thanking God for the good things that He's given Him. In the book of Nehemiah, for example, Mattaniah gave thanksgiving in prayer. And we see different people in the Bible 
who ba break, bed, break bread and they give thanks for their food, right? And we do that today. We pray over our food before we eat. It also says in Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. It also says in Colossians 4, 2, and 3, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying for us, also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. And so we talked about thanksgiving, but let's move on to our next point, and that is we should pray for soul winning. We should pray for the word of the Lord to go out and reach the whole world. You know, that was the verse that I just read to you. And it also talks about that in Luke chapter 10 and verse 2. It says, Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. So we should be praying for the word of the Lord to reach the people of this world. It also says in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 1 and 2, it says, I exhort therefore that first of all, before you do anything else, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, and specifically it says, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And so we should pray for the leaders of our world to give us free course so that we can go out and preach the gospel and we can preach what we want to from the pulpits of America. Now turn, if you would, to Second Chronicles chapter 1. So I've given you many things to pray for so far. Let's talk about another one, uh, and that is wisdom. Praying for wisdom is a great prayer in the Bible. It says in James chapter 1 and verse 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God to give it to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So a great prayer to pray is for wisdom because God wants us to have wisdom. You know, he wants us to have wisdom so we can serve him better. Now, I wanted to take a look at an example of someone who prayed for wisdom and God answered that prayer. It says in 2 Chronicles chapter 1, this is King Solomon. It says in verse 7, In that night did God appear unto Solomon and said unto him, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said unto God, Thou hast showed great mercy unto David my father, and hast made me to reign in his stead. Now, O Lord God, let thy promise unto David my father be established, for thou hast made me king over a people like the dust of the, of the earth in multitude. Give me now wisdom and knowledge, that I may go out and come in before this people, for who can judge this people that is so great? And so that's, that was Solomon's prayer. He just asked for wisdom. He didn't ask for anything else. He just asked for wisdom. Let's see what God says to him in, in verse 11. And God said to Solomon, Because this was in thine heart, and thou, ask not, and thou hast not asked riches, wealth, or honor, nor the life of thine enemies, neither yet hast thou asked long life, but hast asked wisdom and knowledge for thyself, that thou mayest judge my people over whom I have made thee king. Wisdom and knowledge is granted unto thee. So see, look, God answered his prayer. But not only that, just like before, he's going to give him a lot more. Okay, so let's take a look. And I will give thee riches and and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings have had that have been before thee, neither shall there any after thee have the like. So not only did God answer his prayer exactly the way that he asked for it, but he also gave him so much more than that as well. Yeah, God can really bless us, but all we have to do is just pray. We just have to ask for it. We just have to ask God for the things that we need. Turn to Acts chapter 7. I'd also like to, to talk about how we should pray for our enemies. You know, Jesus talked a lot about this in the Bible. It says in Luke 23 and 34, this is whenever Jesus is being crucified. He said, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And that took a lot for him to do that. You know, he prayed for his enemies, and he prayed for God to forgive them. It, uh, he, it also says in Matthew chapter 5, and verse 44, Jesus talked about this. He said, But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And Luke 6, 28, it says, Bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. Also, in the book of Job, in uh, chapter 42, and verse 10, it says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. 
right? So Job prayed for his friends that God would forgive his friends for being so stupid throughout the entire book of Job. But not only that, not only did God uh, answer his prayer, but it also says, it says, also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. So not only did God answer his prayer, but he gave him so much more as well. Prayer is a great tool. We, we need to pray more. So you're there in Acts chapter 7. Look at, let's look at another example of someone who prayed for his enemies, prayed for pe people who didn't like him. You know? And this is, the, this is Stephen, and Stephen is about to get stoned. It says in verse 54, When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, listen to this, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And so we should pray for the good for our personal enemies, you know, for our enemies who may not like us for whatever the reason, we should pray for God to uh, bless them and, you know, help them, help them to see the truth. <clears throat> and the final thing that we can pray for, and, th and this is the only negative thing that we should, that uh, I'm going to go over tonight, but we should pray for the enemies of the Lord. You know, we should pray good for our own enemies, but for the enemies of the Lord, that's a little bit different, you know, that we should pray uh, not for their good, but for their hurt. You know, it says in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So he says it twice. And so there are certain people that we should just let them be accursed. We should just say, you know, we should just curse them in the name of the Lord because they're the enemies of the Lord. You know, and then that's the only negative thing that I'm going to go over tonight about that. But, you know, why did I pray this? Or why did I preach this, you know, about prayer, right? And it's because I want all of us to pray more. You know, I want us to have a better understanding of what prayer is and what it isn't. And, we, and I wanted to give you guys a lot of things to pray for. And I wanted you to understand that there is great power behind prayer, you know. And... God can bless us. God can give us so much more than what we already have. All we have to do is pray. You know, all we have to do is ask Him. And I hope that you guys got that from my sermon tonight. And uh, I, I hope that it was edifying for you. So uh, let's pray.